Thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here. Um, I'm Laurence, the Executive Director of the French American Chamber of Commerce. Um, as you know, we're a non-profit organization, uh, non-governmental, and our, our mission is to foster the French American business community. Uh, this year, we foster it digitally, but we are glad to do so. Um, and we help companies to come and develop their activities in the US. Uh, so we do that thanks to our members, our events, and our corporate services. So one of our members is Shepard Malin, and, uh, and I think uh, Christina Figure is here. Uh, she's a board member of the FACCSF. And we have our guest, uh, Reed Witten, who is managing partner of the London office, who is here as well, and who, will, uh, who is our guest speaker today. So thank you very much, Reed. Um, so Shepard Malin is a benefactor member uh, of our organization. So I want to thank, uh, thank them very much to be involved uh, with us. Um, and so I'm pleased to introduce, so I, what I was saying is that uh, Reed is a managing partner of, of the Shepard Merlin London office, so based in London, and he serves clients uh, that have a presence in the US um, and, and that are also uh, in Europe and have a uh, subject to the US uh, regulation. So uh, he also lectures the law of international business as an adjunct professor university in the UK, in France and the US, and is featured as a commenter on the UK television news discussing US law and its impact on international business. Um, so for our program today, uh, he will give us, uh, as you know, an, an outlook uh, for international business under a Biden administration. So what's going to happen in the next four years? Um, I know you can't wait to hear all about it. Um, so if you, we'll all be in mute today. So if you want to ask any question to read, please feel free to do so in the chat. Um, he will do his presentation and then we'll ask all the questions in the chat after. So I'll moderate the chat right after. And now I'm, I can turn over to, uh, to read uh, to, to start the presentation. Thank Thank you again for being here. Merci Laurence et merci à vous tous pour avoir nous joindre aujourd'hui. Uh, je suis très heureux de, de faire cette présentation pour vous, the French American Chamber of Commerce, San Francisco. Um, I'm, it's very nice to get to see you, see you all. Uh, it's been a bit, a bit difficult to make in-person visits, but I hope to be back in Northern California again soon uh, and look forward to meeting some of you then. Um, this is typically the part of my presentation where I would introduce myself more fully, but Laurence has really done a great job. So um, I'll just take a minute to quickly explain why I'm giving you this presentation today and, and a little background on, on Chevron Mullen and what it is that I do. Um, so Chevron Mullen is a global law firm, but we have seven offices there in California and, and two European offices. So we fit together well with the types of businesses that are in the French American Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco um, because we have you know, local council, but they're connecting Europe to the West Coast. Um, and this is why, you know, I thought I'd come here and speak to you all today uh, about the trends in international business. So um, keep in mind that the idea behind this presentation uh, is that what happens in the U.S. really affects businesses in the U.S., but also operations and transactions kind of around the world. Uh, and that's, that's why many of you have decided to join us and use your valuable time to, to see this presentation today. Um, now, as Lauren said, if you have questions about any point we cover, please don't hesitate to submit it through the chat function and, and we'll get it asked at the end. Um, but if we can't get to your question in this program, I'm going to be glad to follow up with you after the program and, and make sure to answer it. Um, my contacts are in the slides. We'll distribute the slides and they'll be available for you uh, anytime after the program. All right. So um, today we're going to start with a little context. Uh, we are going to uh, let me see. I'm also driving the slides, so it may just take a second to switch between them. But uh, today we're going to start with a little context and background of the macro level trends that are going to influence uh, the next four years. And then we will move through the um, five sort of aspects of international regulation, as well as the geopolitical strategy. And, and we're going to we're going to discuss how these elements are going to combine um, to be implemented by the Biden administration and then how they will impact your international work. All right, so the single biggest macro trend that may affect the Biden administration, as well as all global economics, is going to be a pandemic recovery. Um, if we have a vaccine that's widely available by, let's say, the middle of next year, and you know, there's no guarantee, but things look good so far, um, uh, there, then there's going to be this sort of pent-up demand that could really bring a, an upswing in local and global economies. And of course, um, there are likely to be some sectors where the recovery is slower and dif more difficult, 
But in, in any case, the post-pandemic rebound would be good news. And when it does come, it's going to bring a wave of economic activity that a new administration is going to have to deal with and manage. Secondly, we expect the Biden administration uh, to be shifting to a more traditional uh, foreign policy towards its U.S. allies. President-elect Biden has been in government for decades, and he understands diplomacy and the nature of, and necessity of multilateral action. We're going to return to that theme a few times during this presentation. Third, and kind of by contrast, um, we think that there's going to be less change with respect to the U.S. position on China. This adversarial posture towards China has become really increasingly bipartisan in the United States in the last four years. And we're gonna go into that relationship in a bit more detail because the adversarial posture of the United States and China not only affects the companies in those two countries, but, but really nearly all participants in the global economy. All right, so with that context set, let's have a look at some of the details on the US-China divide. A little background here, you know, U.S. policy on China since really the Nixon administration has been to engage with China and through cooperation and competition, push it towards becoming a free market economy. But in 2018, you may recall, President Trump's national security strategy expressly named China as a strategic adversary of the United States. And so this NSS set out a new kind of strategic struggle with China, and the objective was technological dominance. Importantly, this now means that the United States takes the position that technological know-how, the tech that your companies may research and develop, is a strategic national asset of the United States. And that plays out in some important ways uh, in the Trump export control regime. And, and we expect the Biden administration to really continue that trend. Just to give you an idea of how anti-China the current U.S. leadership uh, really is, I'd like to introduce you for a second to Peter Navarro, who is the economic advisor of the president, and his two books, Death by China and the Coming China Wars. Uh, in our view, the Biden administration is not going to have the kind of zealots uh, that, that pursue this sort of end, this zero-sum end game with China, um, but we do think that they will maintain some of that adversarial posture with China, and, and particularly with respect to technology controls. Um, the main change we expect to see in all of this is that the trade team of Biden's will be working towards specific, quantifiable foreign policy goals with respect to China. And again, we come back to this theme of practical diplomacy that we <clears throat> have not seen for some time. So let's look where we are now with respect to China and, and how that might change. So the Trump administration, as you may know, has taken several steps to restrict the world's supply of technological know-how, particularly to one of the largest tech consumers in the world, which is Huawei. So for those of you in the tech industry, this is going to be very familiar territory. Um, the government's used U.S. used controls on U.S. technology um, <clears throat> to block European, Asian, and even Chinese companies from supplying Huawei. And this is a really interesting step that they've taken and worth looking at a little bit more for, for two reasons. One, it's the U.S. regulation with perhaps the broadest effect on non-U.S. companies. And second, the targeting that's being done here can be repeated kind of easily uh, against Hello? Oh, sorry. thought that someone was calling in. Um, the steps that we're taking against Huawei can really be repeated against any uh, company that we designate as a target to cut off their supply chains. So to explain a little bit about this, <clears throat> the U.S. export controls can restrict the movement of technology uh, on any item or equipment uh, that is made from U.S. technology or that is made on equipment that comes from U.S. technology. So you have the U.S. and you have, let's say, this represents your U.S. Oh. idea, your technology, and, uh, and it goes anywhere in Europe. And it goes into a logistics chain and the product is made in Europe. Um, that product that's made from a U.S. technology or on a machine that's made from U.S. technology requires a license in order to go to Huawei. Otherwise, it's prohibited. And this is this is also true for supply chains in Asia. So we have Chinese companies that require licenses to transfer Chinese-made products to Huawei. I mean, this is a, a massive government overreach, but it's, it's something that you need to pay attention to because <clears throat> it's a very effective way of cutting off another company, and it won't be a tool that is easy for a Biden government to put away. 
excuse me just a second. <clears throat> We've also seen the Trump administration use investment controls and its sanctioning powers to block the use of WeChat and TikTok in the United States. Now, the restrictions on WeChat and TikTok have been enjoined for the moment, but they are really an object lesson for, say, tech and social media companies because <clears throat> it shows that if you have an investor uh, in your company and, and that investor is from a, a nation we see as an adversary like China, the the if the U.S. government believes that that adversary company might have access to U.S. person data, then suddenly your company might be under threatening and sudden scrutiny. Um, and and so it's very important that the companies, for instance, in the startup field, which many in you know San Francisco are, and particularly in 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 new media, which many in San Francisco are, um, are aware that their rounds of investment are going to be reviewed and watched because. The government is very keen on looking out for potential access by Chinese parties to U.S. person data. The current administration has really cast a wide net in the technology controls, but it's expressed a particular focus on the areas that you see listed here. Um, any of the companies that are working in these areas that have funding or supply chains or sales even in the U.S. and in China really going to be feeling the tension between these two countries. And in our view, it's likely that tension will continue into the next administration. So the question we're answering for a lot of clients is, on the next slide, is will we be forced to choose a, slot, a side? Um, with the end of the Trump administration, this question really becomes less urgent. There's going to be fewer of the zealots that we talked about in the US government that see this confrontation as a zero sum game. But that anti-China sentiment will continue. And it seems unlikely that the Biden administration will really back away from it too much. Um, we don't believe that companies will need to choose a side necessarily, but we have had discussions with, the, with uh, our multinational clients and, and at some at, at board level, because they're really thinking at a strategic level on how to do business on, on both sides of this growing divide. Um, We've counseled them on developing a sort of internal State Department with one or more persons that are kind of tasked with monitoring and analyzing developments and, and as appropriate, working with industry groups to engage in government relations to try and drive the, the policies that will allow businesses to continue their research, development, production, sales, and everything like that in both the United States and in China. I mean, it's very important for these, for companies like many of yours that you know have representation have do work in the United States and elsewhere to know how that divide will be moving so that that you can uh, you can adjust and accommodate the next topic we talked about are sanctions um, as you may know the Trump administration imposed some 3500 sanctions measures in only four years including listing UN International Criminal Court members as uh, as designated targets of sanctions um, we think Biden is going to roll back some of those actions and shift the focus of others. So most notably, President Trump withdrew the United States from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is also called the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal. Um, simultaneously, the U.S. unilateral sanctions against Iran were ratcheted up in what was called a maximum pressure campaign. Now, the president-elect Biden has stated that maximum pressure has failed and he's willing to return to the to the jcpoa it's not clear though what conditions he might put on that return it's also not clear what kind of credibility the u.s might have if one president can enter agreement that it doesn't get ratified by congress and the nice one might just tear it up again um so and then the recent uh, assassination of the of a nuclear scientist in iran has also complicated the the negotiations that might revive the jcpoa but if Biden does take steps to reduce sanctions on Iran, the biggest beneficiaries would be uh, people or companies in Europe and Asia, including many French companies. Um, the sanctions that would lift are the secondary sanctions that, that penalize non-US companies for doing business in Iran. For instance, we work with a number of banks across Europe, including French banks that have a keen eye on this area because they then may be allowed to move currency in and out of the country but of course, they're a little shy about that because of cases like the BNP Paribas case, 
where they were penalized nearly $9 billion for sanctions violations. So it's, it's of keen interest to many in Europe um, what happens with the JCPOA in, in the Biden administration. In Russia, uh, by contrast, I think that the Biden's going to take a, a tougher stand or continue the tough stand. Um, you'll recall that that Putin spoke, I mean, sorry, that uh, Trump spoke admiringly of Putin um, and even kind of credited his word above the analysis of, of U.S. intelligence. Um, but, but you see here that the U.S. really did take a tough foreign policy stance on Russia, but tough is kind of in quotation marks because many of the sanctions that the U.S. placed on Russia were implemented by congressional legislation, not by the president. Um, so the tough stance is really kind of despite the president's personal feelings towards Putin. We think that President-elect Biden is really going to maintain or strengthen the sanctions on Russia and target those measures where he thinks that it hurts most. And generally, that's understood to be Russian oil and natural gas industries, maybe Russian banking, uh, and of course, uh, the individual oligarchs that help prop up the Putin regime. In the Americas, we view it as unlikely that Biden's going to shift his policy substantially on Cuba and Venezuela. And our thinking really boils down to one reason. <clears throat> Biden lost the state of Florida uh, because of a surprising turnout of Cuban and Venezuelan Americans in Miami-Dade County, where this Republican advertising blitz really tied him to the socialist leaders of Cuba and Venezuela. And so, right or wrong, a Biden administration will need to work to undo that damage. And it really can't be seen as easing up on either of those two countries unless there's a change at the top of either country. All right, next, you are all likely aware of the international nature of the US bribery regulations and the US enforcement actions under the FCPA. Um, and so the question really is what does the next four years bring for enforcement of these anti-bribery reactions? And we've got a few thoughts on that in these little panels here. The first is that we're gonna have a new playbook for prosecutors, but it's gonna look a lot like an old playbook from the Obama, Obama administration. Um, you may be familiar with the most famous page of that playbook, which is called the Yates Memo. Uh, it's a document that was written in the Department of Justice in 2015 that effectively says that if a corporation would like to have consideration, would like a reduction of potential penalties for cooperation with the government, they have to name individuals involved in the misconduct, regardless of the individual's status or seniority. Um, that is a heavy mandate and a real uh, targeting of individuals in companies. So in 2018, the Deputy General, <clears throat> Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, he announced that the DOJ would relax that approach. Um, it's not clear if Sally Yates herself will be back in the department, but it, it seems like the department is going to return to that approach of targeting individuals in, in anti-bribery enforcement actions. We see this numerous uh, rank and file here in the second panel. Many of you may know that the administrative position on uh, the, sorry, the current administration's position uh, on, admin, on what they call the administrative state was that it was against a lot of the uh, folks in the agencies. And, and as a result, the agencies really emptied and remained unfilled. I mean, there were fewer resources dedicated to recruiting and replacing personnel that decided to leave uh, under the Trump administration or who were just lost to, to attrition. There's really no sign that the same would happen under a Biden administration. The transition team is already assembled. In fact, actually, one of our colleagues at Shepard Mullen in Washington, D.C., is part of the transition team for the Department of Homeland Security. And, and early reports indicate that the transition team is already sending feelers through the legal community to scout the best and brightest. Um, and there's also a feeling of kind of getting the old band back together. And I have a lot of Washington net lawyers in my network because I, I worked there for eight years. And I'm hearing that the folks that were initially invited to participate in the various transition teams for the Department of Justice are all folks with substantial previous government prosecution experience. Um, with little doubt that they're going to bring along their colleagues and their associates and the empty offices are going to be filled in January or very soon thereafter. Uh, eager and driven, you'll see that 
these people that come are going to want to make their mark, whether they're ideologues or they just want to be known. Uh, some of you may know this, but when you walk through the halls of the DOJ fraud building in DC, you see pinned to the door of each of the prosecutors, like, like hunting trophies on, on a wall, you see the headlines of the largest enforcements that they brought in. I mean, so these people are actually out there hunting and enjoy bringing down companies. Um, and I think there's going to be more of those people, more of the types of ideologues that look for those big, big scores. Um, and I think they're going to be out beating the bushes uh, and we'll see a new an, an uptick in enforcements in the coming year. Sector risk focus and geographically agnostic will take together. I think to the extent that a culture of an administration has an effect on the prosecutorial decisions, um, you'd see potentially you would have seen prosecutors in a fossil fuel friendly Trump administration hesitate to go after oil companies, for instance, in, in that sector. Um, you might geopolitically see an uncertainty what our relations are with, say, Russia or Saudi Arabia, because you have different messages coming from the top. So there might have been some geographic uh, push one direction or another. I think that a Biden administration enforcement will probably be much more by the book. It'll be by where the traditional risks are, and it'll be prioritized in that way. And lastly, sophisticated analysis. Now, we recognize that, especially in the high-risk industries, you've been through enforcement sweeps before. By and large, this is a group of sophisticated companies with mature compliance infrastructure. Many of your companies will have added also the compliance infrastructure required under Sapin II uh, for, for the French law that applies to, to them. We don't think that anyone in the G DOJ or the SEC expects to find uh, your VP of sales handing out bags of cash. At the same time, neither do the government prosecutors. They've become more sophisticated in recognizing indicia of corruption that's farther afield, farther away from the source, um, activity on the ground in country that may lead back to persons that are acting on your company's behalf. So what we're recommending is that, that companies, even with solid compliance infrastructure, are out there sort of checking their perimeter and, and really checking the defenses that they have to make sure that they are protecting against the liability that can be created by parties that the companies deal with. All right. Next, we're gonna look at import and customs. Now, I know this is a very dry topic and it's uh, not as sexy or interesting as geopolitical sanctions or bribery investigations, but there are serious risks to importers here and we wanna be certain to cover those. So, as you can see, the US Customs and Border Protection has really increased its audit and other enforcement activity in recent years. Um, this is because the agency, it absorbs, it vacuums up uh, loads of data on imports, on importers and, and the patterns and costs of those things. And, and the agency now uses these sophisticated algorithms to identify potential violations. And then it just sends a questionnaire to the company. And often where the company is able to explain their import and customs claims, they're, they're you know, passed by. Um, where they're unable to do so, they're often audited. And the customs audit is an expensive and painful process. Um, so in this case, we recommend with for, for any company with an import book of over maybe $100,000 a year that you check your customs broker to ensure your customs records are complete and accurate. Um, and that if you receive a questionnaire from customs, contact your counsel as soon as you can. The questionnaire is not just a survey. It is really a call from the cops and you definitely want to have your lawyer make sure that you are appropriately responding um, to their to that uh, what could be an entree into an investigation or an audit um, and you want to really reduce that possibility with your full and complete answer finally we're going to touch on the trade agreements uh, because they've been a big point of contention for the trump administration which throughout a number of sweeping trade agreements. You'll remember the uh, the potential agreement with Europe, the TTIP, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, um, that they tore up almost the day they came into office. 
Um, we think that the Biden administration is going to take a different tack, but they're going to have an uphill struggle for that. Um, so first, the most substantial trade restrictions put in place by the Trump administration were the 25% tariffs on just billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports. We think it's likely the Biden administration will reduce some of those tariffs, but it's going to maintain many and it's going to target them really to try and effectively achieve U.S. goals of curbing Chinese state support for its companies uh, and fighting the IP theft that is really endemic in the Chinese business client. Uh, this is, again, another reflection of that growing bipartisan consensus on confronting China. Uh, importantly, in the, for this crowd, with respect to the EU and UK, um, I think that the Biden administration will take away some of the tariffs off products that, that are, are now in place as a goodwill gesture uh, to show that the United States is taking a closer approach with its longtime allies across the Atlantic. Um, trade disputes like the Boeing Airbus dispute, they're not going to go away. But the biggest change is that trade policy with Europe will be more stable and predictable. And there's going to be this rational, measured response by a kind of more professionalized international trade policy team. And that should really help uh, with industries like the automotive sector, which was under constant threat uh, from President Trump that he might impose tariffs on. Let's see, on the WTO, I think the Biden administration is going to take a, a, a broader view um, than the Trump administration has. I, we expect them to take steps to restore the WTO norms and institutions that have really been built up slowly since 1945. Um, but that have been cut back in the Trump administration. But the most important change is really this one. It, it is, it, it's hard to overstate just how disruptive unilateral foreign policy action can be, right? The United States is gonna need to chart its own course, but we expect the Biden team is gonna take into account the needs and wishes of its allies. And even when it decides to go across those wishes, away from those wishes, act against the wishes of its allies, it's gonna do so with clarity so that all parties can adjust. And I think this is the biggest and possibly the most positive change, right? Any given policy might be good or bad for business, but as long as it's clear and transparent and predictable and well communicated, the companies that are affected by it can adjust and markets can accommodate the changes. Um, we think that a bit more stability in international relations uh, will be really for the benefit of all clients and across industries. All right, so that was my 25 or 30 minutes of prepared material, um, but I now have time to answer your questions. And remember, if you do not get your questions answered today, or if a question later, arises later on, please uh, do not hesitate to contact me. Um, I had thought that my contacts were at the end of this, but in the version that I distribute to this group, uh, my contacts will be at the end of this. Uh, so you have those. But for now, uh, Laurence, do you have any questions that came in from the chat? Yes, yeah, so we have a question. It, it's a little bit long. It's more kind of a remark. Um, I don't know if you can answer on that side, but it's more on the on the visa side. So more on the immigration side, what, what do you think that, you know, what is the the projection um, regarding that because it's, it has been very restrictive with the Trump administration, especially for entrepreneurs visa, you know, um, to, to set up ah. more activity in the US. So uh, do you have a sense of what's going to happen if they're going to, you know, be more flexible or, or if they're going to continue as the Trump administration did? I don't know if you have a few comments. I know you're more on the business law side, so uh, this question might not be exactly in your scope, but, you know, you might. Uh, no, I, I, and, and so just to give someone, the, the folks, the, a, a flavor of the question, there is a, <clears throat> a reduction of the validity of investor visas for French nationals from uh, 60 to 25 months. And, and it might have been 15 at one point, but it, it was changed back. Um, the, that seems to be the questioner has, has noted uh, <laughs> insufficient. Uh, he seems fairly vehement on this point. Um, but because we, 
because re-upping a investor visa every 25 months is is just too much of a burden. Um, yeah. It, 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 um, it's a good question. The, I think that the immigration policy more largely, I, 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 don't, I don't have a specific answer for this one, um, but though I do agree that it does seem a bit difficult to, you know, every two years to have to go and reapply. Um, but, uh, but on immigration more generally, Biden will have been elected by a, uh, an electorate that is going to be more open to uh, immigration reform. That is immigration, uh, allowing immigration and immigration steps for the betterment of American business culture. Um, there, the Trump administration was almost hamstrung um, because of its, because it used, it fired up its base with <clears throat> all these anti-immigrant rhetoric even sensible uh, sort of obvious policies like like the one that the questioner here mentions, um, where if you have an investor visa, it should give the person time to invest and see their investment grow, um, couldn't be done because it could be spun in that sort of MAGA media world as helping immigrants. And there was just such, such uh, virulent anti-immigrant sentiment among that base um, that, that they were they were almost locked into a reflex every time against anything that that helped uh, anyone who was coming to the United States from abroad. So I think that um, the the Biden administration will be much more free to respond to these sorts of uh, of issues, uh, and will not be not be as limited as the Trump administration was or chose to be. Um, but I'd be happy to discuss that offline with the questioner. Meridian, of course, and and also we have uh, you know. Um, at, I know at, at Shepard Mullin, there is also more kind of a, the immigration side. I know it's really different for um, like lawyers can cannot know every every law and every regulation. So so, but we we can you know transfer the question after. Um, also, read a, a, another question would be um, we know that you know for for a lot of people they they assimilate a little bit Trump with a more pro business administration, whereas we maybe. We, it's less maybe uh, known for the Democrats. What, what do you think it's, um, it's going to um, happen on, 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 on that side? The, the Democrats so are less business friendly? The US Republican administration are more pro-business. Um, and do mm -hmm. you think that the administration proposed agenda could hurt multinationals doing business in the US or could have a negative impact on the US or globally? Yeah, so that's... That that's 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 a, a good point. There, there has been traditionally a um, a view uh, that that Republican Party is pro business and that the Democratic Party um, <clears throat> will implement policies that will will injure business. Um, but I think that especially for the Biden administration, those concerns are a little overblown. Um, you know, there were the last administration, the Trump administration. Um, almost went to farther than than it kind of got out over its skis on deregulation and some of the like environmental safeguards that they took away you'd have companies reacting by saying hey you know what the u.s withdrew from the paris climate accord but we're going to try and maintain the goals of that paris climate accord so they they sort of went kind of counter to where the business community was rather than meeting them where they wanted to be um biden is a centrist you know he's not interested in nationalizing industries or, or any of those sort of extreme measures that, that, that you might think of uh, with ultra left kind of groups. Um, but he will try and undo some of the say tax breaks for companies that the Trump, the Trump administration was giving out. Um, probably the, the, for this crowd, the global intangible low tax income, guilty tax, um, is one that might be an effect um, that, that is, is raising that or doing it, making his efforts to bring that in uh may affect companies that are that are represented by folks listening here um most of the economic measures i think will really be aimed at sort of onshoring american business and their production uh and getting the appropriate amount of tax revenue out of them so so i, I don't think it'll be injurious to business and again i think it'll all be very clearly communicated so that markets can adjust thank you Reed. Um, regarding data privacy now, um, we know that uh, Europe has been implementing the, the GDPR 
um, act. And do you foresee U.S. data protection regulation taking a prominent place in the Biden administration agenda? So, no, no <laughs> is the simple answer. But um, basically, it's, it's certainly not in the same way as like as GDPR. Um, you know, as as you all well know, California instituted the CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act, uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, my sense is that's as far as Americans really want to go. From the privacy laws, just don't have the same kind of cultural support in the United States that they do elsewhere. So, so it's easy for data mining companies to kind of, kind of their lobbyists to kind of keep down federal efforts at, at uh, restrictions. But the question is very different um, when it comes to national security. So the position really changes because you have uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. And so that committee is authorized to scrutinize transactions where foreign companies might gain access to U.S. Person, personal data. Uh, you think about TikTok and WeChat, that, that was part of the reason that they were restricted. Uh, and then uh, you have an investment by a Chinese company in the dating app Grindr. That investment that they made, that the Chinese company made, was in 2016. And then in 2019, the U.S. government came back and said, that's it. We think it's a threat to personal data. You have to divest your investment. And um, that's currently mostly a concern with China, but it, it is, in theory, could be it could be any foreign investor. So uh, for those companies that have foreign parents that, have, that use or have access to U.S. personal data, which is they every company because they all try like try to collect as much data as they can on their customers. Um, it is a concern in that sense, but data privacy as as it's done in the GDPR, unlikely. Thank you, Reed. Another question from Usla, um, a little bit broad, but maybe you, you have a, an answer. Uh, what will be uh, Biden's approach to the to the EU? Uh, much much friendlier, <laughs> I think is the is the short answer there. Um, can you still hear me all right? I, these headphones are sometimes temperamental. Um, the, I, I think that, that Biden is going to go uh, out of his way early in his presidency to establish a tone of collegiality with, with uh, traditional allies, particularly the EU, particularly NATO countries. Um, I think that the damage that was done to a lot of the world order that had been built over the decades between the U.S. and Europe um, was lamentable, uh, and I'm sure that it was felt by a lot of the folks in this call uh, when there were tensions between the United States and, and Europe. Um, but I think Biden's going to go uh, make a, a demonstration of his dedication to our European allies. Um, and interestingly, I'd say post-Brexit, uh, I don't think he's going to take a side um, but he will not be, he will not have an incentive to give the UK a free pass in the same way that uh, a Trump administration that were very supportive of nationalist ideas and the separatist notions of Brexit. Um, I think that they'll have a, a free trade agreement negotiation in good faith, which means that basically the UK is going to get its lunch eaten by the US because they're just not the same size, right? So if the U.S. wants to send genetically modified organism products, GMO products, over to UK. What's the UK going to do? <laughs> Say no, no, because they're not—they're not a market of 27 countries anymore. So um, I think that that, just by the nature of the negotiation, is really going to be tough, particularly on uh, on the UK. But with respect to the EU, I think that they'll um, they will they will man, they will maintain good relations. Um, I don't think we'll get uh, an EU-US free trade agreement. I think that road is just too hard for Biden to try to travel in the current political climate. Um, but I think that many of the people in his staff would be in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. Um, I'm trying to see the other, um, other questions. Uh, what concern do you have about Biden administration? And conversely, what are you looking forward to under a Biden administration? No. Huh. Um, okay. So my concern is that uh, the real progress on any, any sort of international issues uh, is going to be limited or hamstrung uh, by this very strange kind of 
MAGA world. And I think you understand what I mean by that when I talk about this media environment that's removed entirely from facts. Uh, it's a very strange uh, situation they find themselves in. I think it's going to be pre former President Trump on the sidelines just making as much noise as he possibly can. Uh, and then it's going to be a distraction that's going to be hard for news outlets not to report on. Uh, whether or not it has relevance in international and in national, international politics. Um, and I, I hope that it doesn't, but my, my concern is that real progress will be hampered by just trying to deal with that strain, that noisy and uh, difficult element. Um, most looking forward to, uh, I, I can't wait to be bored, to wake up in the morning and not, and like, not think about what the president might have said or done that me living here in London will have to explain to my UK neighbors and be like, yeah, I don't know about that one. Um, so yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you, Reed. Um, I'm just trying to see if there are other questions, but I don't think so. And it's almost anywhere. Uh, we're almost past the, the time. Um, so no, I think I mean, if you have any other question, it's the last, last, uh, last chance to ask. Um, but otherwise, we, we can close the, this webinar. And I know, so we'll share the presentation if you, if you agree, uh, read to, uh, to share the slide. Uh, we'll send a thank you email to everybody with the slides. Um, we also recorded the webinar. So if you want to re-see it, we'll send a link um, with, the, with the video. Uh, and, and we'll share the, um, um, the email of, of Reed if you, if you want to ask him question directly. Um, so thank you very much again, Reed. It was a pleasure to have you. It was very interesting. And, and we, we hope that um, everything's going to be, the transition will be smooth uh, anyway for all the businesses here in, in, in the US. Um, thank you again for, for, this, um, for this presentation and, and remark. Uh, thank you to Shepard Melin for, for being um, uh, an active member of the FACCSF and also involving the the offices that are based in, in everywhere. So right now the, the office in London, but uh, so I know you have two offices in California, no, two, two offices in Northern California, but so San Francisco and Palo Alto, and you have one also in Los Angeles, a little bit everywhere, but so thank you uh, very much for, for everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you, every, sorry, everybody for being here today and for following our uh, webinar. It was the last uh, webinar of the year. So as you know, it has been a, a digital year for us. Us. We moved. Um, hi, Andrea. I see you. <laughs> um, we uh, we moved our events uh, to uh, digital events for now. We hope we can welcome you in person soon. We'll see what's happening in the next few months with the vaccines and um, and everything around COVID. But in the meantime, uh, we wish you a happy holidays. Uh, we hope to see you in uh, in good shape in 2021. Uh, if you're not a member yet, become a member of our organization because uh, so we have a lot of programs coming on. So if you're a member, you can benefit from, from many things such as corporate services, business introduction, and, and of course, our entire network. Um, so if you're not yet members, you should be. Um, and thank you very much. Um, hope to see you soon and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Merci.